this video, we're going to be broken monads through examples, through list, maybe, and I.O. Sometimes a function cannot return a result for some reason. You can think of dividing by zero or getting square root of a negative number. Maybe data type represents a computation that fails to return a value for some reason. It's a safe alternative to null. Maybe it will either contain a value or nothing at all. Just represent a success and contains a value. And nothing represents a lack of output. Maybe represents a way to make a safety wrapper for functions that can fail to work for some arguments. For example, looking up a key in a map or getting ahead of a list. Lookup function either returns a corresponding value as a just or nothing if the key is not in the map. So let's look at example. Lookup key definition is a function called lookup and we have a key which is some sort of thing, it doesn't matter what, and a map from key to some random value and it returns a maybe of this name. In the first example, lookup of the name of the real book from some book price catalog, whatever, it doesn't matter, returns just with a number. And in the second case, lookup of nothing, of non-existing book is gonna return nothing. Let's look at another example. Safety hat function returns a head of non-empty list as just value or nothing if the list is empty. In the first case, it's simple. We have safe hat of a list of three values and we just return a first one. Second case, we just return nothing because the list is empty. Let's look at more real life examples. Imagine a real life library service, which includes some functions for looking up available books and checking their status. We could start with three simple functions defined as following. Look up book functions, look up a book from a library by book title. And if the book is not there, it's gonna return nothing. And get book status returns a book status from a book catalog. If for some reason the book is not in the catalog or something went wrong, it also returns nothing. And the last function get return date tries to get the return date out of the book status and result is optional because the field is optional, for example. You can use these functions to get the status of the book by title. First, we look up the book by title, but then we have to check if the function actually returned the book. And then only if the book is available, we can look up the book status. Otherwise we return nothing because no book, no status. Know that it doesn't matter where this library and catalog are coming from or how they're defined is just an example. You can also use all three functions together and find out the return date of the book by title. On top of what we already done and defined before, we have to check if the book has a status and only then we can check for return date. If there is no book, we return nothing. If there is no book status, we also return nothing. At this point, I should point out that it's obviously a lot of repetition, it obviously doesn't look nice, and we should obviously see a pattern here. If any of the steps fail by returning nothing, the whole function returns nothing. Otherwise, we keep applying function to the next value to the next value. I would like to introduce an operator called bind. It takes an argument of type A that may fail, it takes a function of type A to B, whose result may fail, and returns the result of type B that may fail. If the argument is nothing, we propagate this nothing. If it contains a value A, we apply a function to this value A and return the value. There is another function that makes our life much easier and it's called pure or return. You could think of it as lifting a value into a maybe. Here's a quick note or notice. We're going to use pure and pretend like return does not exist throughout the course. But you'll definitely bump into return here and there in the real world. So if you actually want to find out what is happening, why are we doing this, see the course notes. Just to iterate before we move on. If the argument is nothing, we propagate nothing. But if it contains a value, we apply a function to a value. Let's get back to the library example and try to refactor all this manual pattern matching with using bind. So first we look up a book and then we get the book status of the book. Only if it's available, 
otherwise it's nothing. Or we could go one step further and simplify it like this. We drop the lambda and we don't have to pass the book explicitly. And then we can refactor the other function, get return day by title. We look up the book and then we get the status for the book. And the result is then used to get the return date from the status. If any of these things return nothing, the function returns nothing. Alternatively, we can write this using do notations, as you see. It's important to have a second notice here and mention that do notations is just a synthetic sugar for chains of these expressions and is going to be translated to pretty much what we saw in the previous slide. If you want to learn more about do notation and how it works, please consult with the course notes as well. But long story short, we use a function lookup book and then we get the status of that book and then we get the return date from the book status. Let's look at another different example. Let's look at the lists. When you look at lists in Haskell, you can think of them either as linked lists, as homogeneous data structures that can store zero or more elements of the same type, or you can think of them as non-deterministic computations that may return an arbitrary number or results. It's similar to how maybe represent the computation that might fail. Lists represent a computation that can represent zero, one, or many values. In this example, there might be no books available. Just like for maybes, there is a bind operator for list. It takes a list of elements of type A. It takes a functions that from an input of this type A returns an undetermined or unspecified number of outputs of type B. And then it returns a single list result that combines all output possibilities for multiple inputs. So in other words, for each value from the list, we pass it to a function that produces a new list. And then at the end, we combine all the elements of our list into one list. And then there is a pure function for this as well. It injects a value into a list, which means it takes and returns one element list. Let's look at a couple of examples. So in the first example, we have a simple list of one to three, and we bind it to a function which returns for each x, x and minus x. And then we can see the result that we get one minus one, two minus two, three minus three. And in the second case, we bind the same list into another function, which in this case, we replace each x with x number of the same x and of different time stream. So we can see that we started from one to three and we went to one, two, two, three, three, three. So let's look at the realistic bookstore service once again. In this case, we have three other functions, get store locations, which returns multiple stores, uh, get store orders, which gets order service, date, specific store, and returns all the orders in the store. And the last function, get ordered books, returns all the books in one order. We can use these functions to make one function that returns all orders for a specific date. We can use binds right away this time. Look at this function, get all orders. We get a specific date and we return the list of all orders. We get store locations and then we bind all of these locations into get store orders using some random order service that doesn't matter what and a date and returns all orders in the store and this date. Or we can implement a function that returns all orders for this date. We keep doing what we've done before, but we also bind one more time to the function get order books, and at the end we get all the books for this order for this date, for these locations. Alternatively, we can also write it using a do notation, as you can see here. First we get store locations, then we get orders, and then we get all the books for the order. Okay, let's look at another example. Uh, IO is a computation. When it's evaluated, it can perform effects before returning a value of type A. Let's look at your computation or program right away. It asks the user for their name, then it gets the line as a text from the user and prints their name back with some greeting. The explicit or the sugar version looks like this. If you squint, it looks pretty much the same. Let's look at the bind function for IO right away. Note that here's only the signature because the implementation doesn't really matter right now and it's not that simple. So we take a computation that will produce some value of type A. We take a function that based on this value gonna compute a second computation 
and return a result resulting computation. It performs the first computation, uses its result to decide what to do next, and then does it. You can also lift pure values into I.O., it's pretty simple. It returns an I.O. value that's already evaluated. No computations needed. So imagine that our service got some fraction and became more interactive. We have to interact with other services, we have to interact with databases, and so on. So let's look at our functions. The first one, fetch customer, gets a customer service, customer ID, performs some computation, and returns a customer account. The second function, fetch last order, gets a database pool, some customer account, and returns the last order for this customer. And the last function, cancel order, gets some order handler, order, and performs some computation, no results. We can build a whole process right now. First, we fetch the customer with a customer service and the customer ID. Then we fetch the last order for this customer using some connection pool. And in the end, we cancel this order with the order handler. Note that one more time, it doesn't matter where well, all the handlers, connection pools, and the services come from. It's just an example. What you have to pay attention to is that we are chaining these functions that we could see a clear sequence of computation from top to bottom. So let's tie it all together and recap what we've done so far. We have looked at different kinds of computations or effects. One of them was optionality, the other one was non-determinism, and the last one was so-called computation. So first we implemented a get return date by title, which returns a book return date by chaining the functions that return optional values. If one of the functions return nothing, the whole function returns nothing. Then we implemented get all order books, which returns all order books by chaining functions that return a non-deterministic number of values, which means a list of values. And last but not least, we implemented cancel last order function, which cancels the last order by chaining functions that perform some computation before returning the result. All of this look quite similar, and this is not specific to maybe list, I.O., or just these effects. It can be used with any instance of a monad. There is some effect that does nothing and produces the given result. And there is bind, which takes a value with some effect, takes a function that, based on the potential result, returns a value with further effects, returns a combined effect. It runs the first effect, applies the functions to the result, and then gets a value along with some further effects. In other words, the first value with an effect decides or determines what to do next. And that's it. This is a monad. But on the serious note, maybe a list and a yaw are more than just instances of monads. And it takes time to get to know them and learn how to use them. Especially, it takes Time to see the commonalities between them. And it takes more than just going through a tutorial, two or three, to see these patterns. It's not obvious that one is a generalization of another and why it is so cool. So I would like to emphasize, don't read Monad tutorials, but if you want to keep working on the puzzle, feel free to check out the rest of the course along with the exercises to test what we've learned. Thank you for watching.